This is Todd Hannigan of St. Mary's University in San Antonio. The following is based on a presentation to the Catholic Biblical Association on August 6, 2016. To start us off in the question of the future of biblical scholarship, I want to focus on asking, what do we want to do, rather than what can we do? I suspect we've all seen new technologies that are flashy, fun, and new, but ultimately fail to help us discover new insight into Scripture. What do we want for the future? We may all have contributions to this list, and we will appropriately have plenty of time for open forum at the end. I'd like to start us off with my hopes for the future. First, I want new discoveries. I want another Dead Sea Scrolls. I want another Cairo Geniza. I want new primary sources that capture insight into the past. I want to add meat to the stew of biblical studies. I'm not patient to wait for the black market to bring the next Bedouin discovery or the next farmer to plow through a library of tablets. I also want more Bibles. For me at least, I don't really mean a newer, better BHS, Rouse, or Nestle Island. Sure it would be great to have sure it would be great to better establish the most original text and authorial intent, but the original text is not the text that became scripture for church and synagogue. What was the Bible to Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, or Ophila, the Arian bishop and missionary to the Goths who translated books into Gothic? What books were included? What languages were used? What books were popular or controversial? What did Jerome think of 4th Ezra? What did Porphyry think of Daniel? When and where do we find copies and citations of Jubilees? When and where was the Song of Songs discussed? What did people choose to write commentaries on? What if we could click on a map, select a century, and know what books and recensions are attested? What if we could open an image of a manuscript from that time and place and look for evidence of how the scriptures were used and experienced? What notes in the margins give evidence of liturgical proclamation and study? Third, I want to share experiences of the past with my students. I would love to be able to bring my students to all the museums and sites I have been privileged enough to visit. And yet, I can honestly say that visiting the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem was less moving to me and less formative of me as a scholar than a certain moment in the classroom. It was the time my Hebrew teacher handed me a copy of John Trevor's photo reproduction of the Great Isaiah Scroll and asked me to prepare chapter 40 for the next class. This came after many sleepless nights with Lambden, BHS, and Walt Keen O'Connor. I had grown, grown accustomed to a certain font, footnotes, chapter and verse indicators, vowels, and line breaks in poetry. I thought I had been reading scripture as it existed in ancient Israel and Second Temp Temple Judaism, but of course I was wrong. I was provided with images, images of the scroll and each column both in color and in monochrome. I was left to myself to explore the significance of vakats and corrections between lines or in margins. As a reader of scripture, there were leaps from reading NAB to BHS, from reading BHS to photographic plates, and from reading photographic plates to reading originals behind glass. For me, the most profound leap was the leap to photographic plates. My point is this. I want to share experiences of antiquity with my students, and I don't think I need a time machine or, or international flights to do so, not that I would turn down offers for either. What do we want for the future? I think I can boil, my, boil down my desires to two categories, which I suspect would cover many of our individual desires, discovery and access. I'd like to take each in turn and talk about what is on the horizon and how it will benefit the future of biblical scholarship. I'd like to use the term digital archeology span to encompass all the new tools we can use to discover and provide access to evidence of the past. The difference is that the digits in question are not the ten fingers with dirt and sand under the fingernails, but the new tools provided for us by science and computers. There are numerous new tools for discovery that aid conventional archaeology. Some of you may be aware of Sarah Parchak's work using satellite imagery to identify sites of ancient ruins based on the principle that plants grow differently depending on whether there is loose soil or stones buried shallowly beneath them. For me, the most exciting potential for new discovery lies in palimpsests. Palimpsests are manuscripts, usually parchment, that were erased and reused to copy a second text. 
Before paper became cheaply available in the West, this was a common practice. Especially in times of famine, it was easier to pull an undesired book out of the recycle bin and rescrape the surface than it was to kill an animal and process the skin into parchment. For me, it only adds intrigue that the erased writings were those judged undesirable. That could include books excluded from the canon, such as jubilees, or recensions, translations, and commentaries deemed suspect or second-rate. Even heretical writings that were valued no more than the parchment on which they were written were still pretty valuable. Parchment could also be recycled in this way if it was outdated, as with a liturgical text, or too cumbersome, as with Origen's hexapla. We know of a synod decree in 691 abolishing the rescraping of biblical manuscripts, which tells us that biblical manuscripts were being palimpsested at least up until this time. On the one hand, palimpsestation is a destructive process. But on the other hand, it gives the ancient writing a renewed purpose and utility for it to be conserved. In a sublimated, erased form, the writings of the Arians survived hidden under cover of, of writings by Augustine. The scribes who performed the rescraping could be more or less diligent. They may have done the minimum to allow a new text to be readable if written in a different script and turned in a different direction. In these cases, scholars have been able to read the erased writings with no more help than a magnifying glass. Other scribes were more diligent, and the erased text cannot be read with the human eye. Some erasures were so complete that we cannot even tell that they are palimpsests. Tests have been conducted on parchment believed not to be palimpsest because no erased writing was visible. But digital archaeology technology was able to recover text even in these extreme cases. If we only count the palimpsests we know to contain unreadable text, over 60,000 palimpsests have been counted in the major libraries of Europe, not counting non-European libraries such as St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. If we can recover otherwise unknown ancient literature from even a tiny fraction of those ancient manuscripts, we will have fresh meat for a generation of scholars to chew on. We will have new primary sources that would impact scholarship in ways comparable to the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think of the ancient manuscript archives of Europe as caves in the desert with lost, ri with lost writings hidden just beneath the surface. I don't want to turn this into a science class, so I'll give only a basic introduction of how digital archaeology helps us read palimpsests. Let's start with the two basic elements of conventional manuscript study, the manuscript and the eye. This 5th cent century palimpsest of the Testament of Moses, overwritten with an anthology of Augustine, looks brown. It actually consists of a wealth of features, including ink from two periods, plus rubrication and marginalia, aged parchment, and various other materials from different stages of the history of the Codex. But it's all brown, and depending on where you're sitting, it may look like a big brown blob. We're not very good at distinguishing and naming browns, as I'm reminded every time my spouse refers to the dishes as green that I would call taupe. It's easy to distinguish blue from red because we have different receptors in the eye for those, but brown triggers all three of our color receptors. We have more trouble seeing the contrast of brown on brown, which brings us to the eye and its limitations. Color perception of the eye is limited in two ways, range and resolution. Our range is limited from blue to red, excluding ultraviolet and infrared. In the past, we have reaped some benefit from ultraviolet lamps and infrared photography, but now we can do much more. Our color perception is also limited in resolution. The normal eye resolves three fundamental colors, red, green, and blue. All the colors we see can be expressed as a combination of those three. When we look at a rainbow, the full spectrum of color reaches our eyes, but we see that spectrum in bands because we cannot distinguish one end of the red band from the other. These bands are to color resolution what pixelation is to spatial resolution. Most of us resolve three colors. Someone with only two kinds of receptors is called colorblind. But what if I could resolve four? Then I could call all of you colorblind. What about five, six, seven? Today's technology can resolve 16 colors. Reds and browns that look indistinguishable to us can be easily resolved with 16 band resolution. Any two materials have discrete spectral signatures, and with spectral imaging, materials that don't 
materials don't look the same unless they are the same. This means we can distinguish one ink from another, ink from dirt, mold, glue, and other materials from the history of the codex. A related question is how we process all this data back into a form that can be appreciated and interpreted through the human eye. Suffice it to say, we have a range of options, ranging from colorful enhancements of contrast to accurate color, more perfect and consistent than conventional photography. The accuracy issue is least sensational, but very important to conservators, because it allows us to compare color char characteristics over time and space. If two parchments and ink palettes are identical, we might infer that they came from the same scribal workshop, even if they are now thousands of miles apart. There is at least one other, percep one other perception that I count as essential, and that is texture. Even good photographs, such as the photo edition of the Great Isaiah Scroll, have trouble answering basic questions. We may see a dark spot in a photo, but don't know if it is raised, recessed, or flat. We don't know how thick it is. It can be difficult to judge if parchment has shrunk, stretched, or otherwise dis distorted. The scores and punctures used by scribes to line a writing may remain only in texture, and similarly dry point notation. The most important way in which texture is important for studying palimpsests is that sometimes we can read the outline of letters where ink had once corroded the surface of the parchment. Even if the ink is completely removed now, the effect on the parchment remains. You may have seen extreme cases when we can read the shape of a letter in a hole where the ink is eaten all the way through. More often the corrosion does not reach pat past the surface, but that is enough. If you've ever had a chance to sit back and observe people working in a manuscript reading room, you might have noticed how much movement there is. People move their heads to different angles, or move the object, or move the light, and all of this is getting at texture. We perceive texture from how highlights and shadows change as the light moves. Reflectance transformation imaging, or RTI, is a fancy way of saying we can capture very fine texture, down to the level of each pixel. We can capture rough and smooth, raised and recessed, thick and thin. Not only can we capture it, we can render it interactively. What you see on screen is pre-recorded to save time, but the point is that we can interact with the image by moving the light around and enhancing the texture. Some of this has been around for 10 years or so. A more recent development is that now this can all be done in any web, web browser, even on a smartphone, with no software to download, install, or configure. That brings me to my second broad category of vision for the future. After we create images that allow people to discover new information about the past, we need to, we need to make those images accessible to everyone. To think about our vision for the future and how we want information to be accessible, I'd like to formulate the question, again, not just in terms of what we can do now, but the ideal to which we might aspire. The, the question then becomes, is there a substitute for first-hand experience? There are a couple of ways in which we can answer yes. Starting with the basics, yes if you can't afford to travel. First-hand experience requires geographic proximity, but the community of scripture scholars today is global. Most of us will never see manuscript or archaeological evidence firsthand, or if we do, it will be long after it has been interpreted and presented in a museum. So the question really becomes, are we content to let one or two editors interpret evidence for us or do we and our students want to experience discovery ourselves from the very beginning? Once something is digitized, it can be duplicated without loss, which could not be said of microfilm and plaster casts. And it can be transmitted cheap cheaply through media such as the internet. Going back to the photographic edition of the Great Isaiah Scroll, it was not easy to produce or cheap to purchase, and if I tried to photocopy it, the quality suffered greatly. For the vast majority of biblicists, literal first-hand access was never possible anyway. But we can go further. Yes, there is a substitute for first-hand experience if your hands are bad for the artifact's conservation, or in this case, your cigarette. Museums and manuscript libraries face a real dilemma in trying to balance opportunity for study and caution in conservation. We used to make plaster casts of objects such as Hammurabi stele and the Moabite stone. 
but those copies were not perfectly safe or perfectly high quality, and they only mildly increased access. Similarly, yes, there is a substitute for first-hand experience if the artifact is behind glass and can't be manipulated. Most of the artifacts that I have seen, I was in no position to do scholarship on. For example, I technically saw the Siloam Tunnel inscription, but only technically. I stumbled upon it in a dark corner of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, but it was behind thick plexiglass, and the faint, diffuse light gave me no real hope of catching enough shadows to read much of the inscription myself. I would have been far better off with an RTI image because I could have interacted with it and visualized the texture. We can keep going. Yes, there is a substitute for first-hand inspection if the artifact is removed from its context. The Siloam Tunnel inscription is not in the Siloam Tunnel. The Kings of Tyre mummies are not in the Kings of Tyre tombs. The Dura Europis synagogue frescoes are not in Dura Europis and no longer next door to the Dura Europis church. Perhaps we're used to using our imaginations in these situations, but what about codices that have been divided and split between several libraries? Or collections from an excavation that have been divided between several museums? Once the constituent parts are digitized, they can be reconstructed and reassembled as if they had never been divided. And if they have been removed from their original context, they can be resituated in 3D models. I think we can go even further. I believe that in the future, digital archaeology will be more powerful than first-hand experience. Not just more democratic and better at recreating context, the digital facsimile will be more capable than the original. A facsimile can improve on first-hand experience if the markings you are looking for are not visible to the human eye. I've been talking about palimpsests, but I believe that's only the beginning. In most palimpsests, we can see enough of the erased ink to know there is more erased ink even where we can't see it. In most archaeological artifacts, we don't know what we can't see. We rely on archaeologists to distinguish meaningless dirt from meaningful evidence in the glance of an eye, and we, re and we rely on editors to notice anything important. Imagine what we might find when anything an archaeologist might examine with human eyes will also be examined with digitally enhanced eyes. Even for objects already in museums, imagine if we combine the advanced technologies with democratized access, such that more data will be studied by more people. Briefly, one more point might anticipate more of what the second panelist will address. A facsimile can improve on first-hand experience if it is integrated with all the tools for study and collaboration you might want. When I saw the Siloam Tunnel inscription in Istanbul, I didn't have with me a Tanakh to look up the passages about Hezekiah, historical paleography charts, access to scholarship suggesting a later date, or any Biblicist colleagues? What if all the supporting evidence, enhancements, and collaborations were integrated into the research environment? I'd like to close with a new vision for the future of biblical studies that builds on the new field of digital archaeology. Digital archaeology can work with traditional digs, but more importantly, can excavate evidence hidden in artifacts already in museums and libraries. We will publish data first and then interpret collaboratively. The discovery process will not precede access as an independent phase, but massive open access will allow countless experts to contribute toward interpreting the data from the beginning. Technology will not dehumanize research, but make it massively more democratic. More websites and more data only get overwhelming if each is its own silo. For this reason, we need to use open standards for interoperability. Standards mean we do not need to learn a new system for every site. But more importantly, it means, com it means computers can share information and do groundwork for us to an unprecedented degree. We will also see a new kind of critical addition harnessing digital technology. We won't be tied to a decision to read a diplomatic or eclectic text, but can go back and forth easily. Local and historical variations won't be buried in the apparatus, and we will be able to read a text continuously, even if it is not the best witness of the most original text. There will be no limit on plates. We will be able to link directly not just to an image, but a region of an image with the enhancement and light position that supports our interpretation. 
the reader can then open and, and interact with the images to test for alternate interpretations. We won't require any one editor to do everything, and we won't be limited to the concerns of that editor. Last but not least, my vision for the future is to bring it all back to the classroom. The experiences that we had separately as lecture, reading, summer digs, museum visits, special collections visits, and original research will be available to anyone in the classroom with a screen, and that is everyone. I see this not as, only, not, as not only making our jobs easier, but inspiring a new generation to fall in love with continuing our profession after us. Thank you.